Sometimes I feel Their so lyrics were so subversive that the Velvet Underground were banned from many record stores and radio stations when they were recording in the 1960s. Yet their cult following endured and even expanded over the years. Almost six decades later, a new documentary is taking a look at the avant-garde outfit which produced songs like Venus in Furs. Director Todd Haynes is here in Cannes to present that film after his visit in 2017 for Wonderstruck, in 2015 for Carol, and in 1998 for another musical odyssey, The Velvet Goldmine. And we're off to meet him. Hi, I'm Todd Haynes, and you're watching Encore in Cannes. Church of Music which never is of land or sea alone, but blooms within the air inside the mind, patterns in motion and action, successions of processionals, moving with the majesty of certainty to part the unparted curtains. Todd Haynes, thank you so much for joining us today. Now, your film, The Velvet Underground, comes out almost 60 years after the group of the same name was formed, and I know you're too young to have seen them perform live. So can you tell me about your relationship with the band and how you came to make this film? I first encountered the music of the Velvet Underground in college. And so this was 1980, a good 10 years after the band had broken up. Uh, but it was a time when I, you know, had already been listening to uh, many different kinds of music. Uh, Bowie, Roxy music, punk rock, Patti Smith, The Clash, you know, all of which owed their so much to this, to this band. And I didn't really know that that was the case. I think this is true for a lot of people. You kind of discover things in a strange, circuitous way and you link backwards to original sources. Uh, and, so, and so it made tremendous sense to me when I found, sort of found this music. It, it identified a root, and it identified an original series of sort of risks and attitudes that leapt out uh, from the norm, even at a time when the norm was being challenged in general uh, during the 1960s. Shiny, shiny, shiny boots of leather Whiplash girl child in the dark you're not the only person to turn your lens on the Velvet Underground. A certain Andy Warhol also filmed them for a documentary he made when they were hanging around in the factory in the 1960s. And I wondered how that film and the persona of Andy Warhol fit in or influenced your film. Well, Andy Warhol uh, basically was moving his attentions from making visual art to making films. And he was very interested in the avant-garde cinema that was growing and bursting around him in the 1960s. And from that, those various steps away from being just a visual artist, he was also starting to be interested in promoting music. And it was around that time that he discovered the Velvet Underground. And they made sense to him in their kind of attitude and their sensibility and their look and the kind of content in their, in their songs. So, and immediately he, they became subjects of his experimental films. So he didn't, he, he rolled them into what was already an incredibly rich, layered, productive world that he called the factory, surrounded by all of these young people making art uh, and being, and acting in his, in his movies, right? Uh, and, but it's sort, of, it, it's sort of inconceivable to think of how this band would have been formed and ultimately gotten the contract and get, gotten that first record released without the imprint of Andy Warhol as a way to sort of make, legitimize it and to give it a context and to give it a following. John Cale and Mo Tucker are the only surviving members of the Velvet Underground, and their accounts really underpin your documentary in a very interesting way. Frontman and guitarist Lou Reed uh, passed away in 2013, and it's quite clear that he was a difficult character, a strong personality. Do you think that someone like Lou Reed would be tolerated or celebrated as an artist today, 
or perhaps judged by harsher standards, cancelled even? I, it's hard to say, it's hard to sort of uh, transpose individuals from this particular time and place and just simply apply them to today's culture and um, in some ways far more rigid criteria for what is allowed and not allowed. Um, but the process of art making is never an easy one and is, and is one that we should never presume there's some simple way to avoid conflict and to avoid um, ambivalence and, in, and avoid difficult topics and even conflicts among people. Uh, I don't think Lou Reed was a predator. I don't think he abused his sort of, uh, he wasn't abusive sexually to people around him. He was just a tough guy. And that is, has always been a part, I think, of art making in different realms, you know, different complicated personalities. And, uh, and in many ways, it's hard to separate it from the work itself and the complexity of the work that it produces. Oh, pardon me, sir. It's furthest from my mind. I'm just looking forward to dear friend of mine. I'm waiting for my man. As you say, it was a very particular era, the 1960s in New York, very avant-garde artistically, and also sexuality seemed to be quite fluid. Do you think that was a freer time socially and culturally if we look at contemporary New York? Yes. <laughs> I think the climate of questioning convention, the climate of questioning heteronormativity, the climate of questioning tradition, and of trying to forge you know, new avenues of, of creative expression, breaking down boundaries between the mediums of art is something that s singles out this particular era in ways that um, are hard to find an equivalent for even in the decades that follow, let alone today. Um, and something that we can continue to derive inspiration from and possibility from in the past. There's things that occurred in the 1960s that I think still feel about as modern and progressive as anything you would see today. And when you look closely at things that you see today, you realize how much they owe to this particular time and place. Todd Haynes, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm.